dear colleagues, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this inaugural lecture to be delivered by Professor John Peters, the Helsinki Settlement Foundation Fellow here at the Helsinki College of Advanced Studies. My name is Sami Pirstrom, I'm the director of the Helsinki College. As most of you know, I think already, the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies is an independent institute within the University of Helsinki with the mission of enhancing scholarly excellence in the humanities and social sciences broadly conceived, including law, behavioral sciences, theology, and also media and journalism studies, obviously. And we also seek to strongly promote international and interdisciplinary cooperation in all these academic areas. In addition to our highly competitive regular recruitment process of fellows, which is based on an annual and open call for applications with an acceptance rate typically around 4%, the Helsinki Collegium also hosts a number of special visiting fellowship programs, which are in most cases externally funded. Among these programs, a very interesting new opening is the Helsinki Salamat Foundation Fellowship. This fellowship is intended for researchers uh, focusing on media uh, and the media industry. The Helsinki, uh, sorry, the Helsinki College for Advanced Studies received a uh, substantial grant from the Helsinki Salamat Foundation for five years, 2013 to 18. And this funding is intended for five research fellow positions, each one academic. It, it's uh, one academic year in length. And, and this, uh, these positions are uh, aimed for internationally known, uh, distinguished senior researchers and professors in the field of media and journalism studies. Within uh, each of these fellowship periods, the, the scholar to be invited is expected to work on her or his individual research project as well as to participate in teaching and other activities of the Finnish academic community within this field. I would here like to most warmly thank the Helsingin Salamat Foundation for this generous funding which enables us to invite leading specialists in media and journalism studies to Finland over the next five years. Now this event here today is the grand opening of this entire fellowship program. We sincerely hope that this program will enrich not only the Helsinki Collegium and the University of Helsinki, but also media and journalism studies more generally both in Finland and perhaps more widely in the Nordic countries. I would also like to thank the special academic committee that was invited to assist me in proposing the scholars to be appointed, as well as the coordinator of, of this program, Dr. Oti Hakola, who, who is actually the person who originally very successfully prepared the grant application to the Helsinki Sanford Foundation. Oti, however, is now in Texas, so she is not with us here today. Moreover, I would like to thank Maria Solkia and Kirsi Reyes, Anastasia from the program team and uh, the other people in the, the college of admin for all the practical arrangements related to this lecture. Now, the Helsinki Sanoma Foundation Fellow of the academic year 2013-14 is John Durham Peters. He is A. Craig Baird Professor of Communication Studies and Professor of International Studies at the University of Iowa in the United States. He received his PhD degree from Stanford University. His many publications include books such as Speaking into the Air, A History of the Idea of Communication, 1999, and Courting the Abyss, Free Speech and the Liberal Tradition, 2005, as well as dozens of journal articles and book chapters on the philosophy of communication, intellectual history of communication research, democratic theory, cultural history, history of media, and so forth. Uh, he has also published uh, in, in diverse related fields, so he's, he's a very strong interdisciplinary character, as we have had the pleasure of, of, of learning already during his stay here uh, at the Helsinki Collegium. His 
works have also been translated into many languages, including Albanian, Bulgarian, Chinese, French, German, Greek, Italian, Lithuanian, Macedonian, Ukrainian. And he's been a visiting professor in several countries. So obviously the Helsinki Coalition for Advanced Studies is, is really proud and honored to have, have him here. We, it's, it's really a great pleasure for us to have been uh, able to invite him to spend this academic year with us here as the Helsinki Sanomat Foundation Fellow. Now, the title Professor Peters has chosen for this inaugural lecture today reflects his key research interests very well, both paper, clothes, and other media. Uh, I think this will be a perfect start for, for his term here and, and, and for this visiting fellowship program more generally. So, uh, once more, thank you all for coming. You're most welcome, uh, most welcome to, to join us on this occasion today. And, and Professor Peters, uh, once more, welcome to the Collegium and Finland. And now, the floor is okay. Thank you so much for that, that warm welcome. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad that you could come. And I hope that the oxygen doesn't disappear from the room entirely so we can tolerate a little bit of uh, cool air. Um, I'd very much like to thank the Helsinki Collegium for the invitation to come, to come this year and a warm welcome. I'm grateful for the Helsinki and Sonomat Foundation for sponsoring this fellowship. And I hope in this lecture to show why it was a good choice to invest in media studies. Um, Sami introduced me as a specialist. I'm afraid in this lecture you're going to see that I'm a generalist, but that's okay. I'm, I'm also grateful to be able to spend a year, in, uh, a year in Finland, which I first visited in 1990, thanks to my friend Dr. Risto Volanen, who is here, and I've made many friends since, many of whom um, I see, see in this room. Um, ecologists like to talk about edge effects, the way that boundary habitats enhance biodiversity. In a similar way, the Canadian historian and media theorist Harold Adams Innes liked to talk about the creativity of the periphery. He was also <coughs> a man from the north. I think something similar holds in Finnish media culture and society. Finland is a good place to experiment with paper and with clouds, for instance. Two media that are characteristic of our times and two in which Finland uh, especially stands out, thanks to the forestry industry and the history of technical uh, innovation and the wonderfully Wi-Fi friendly environment. Um, I just got back from France. Don't get me started about French Wi-Fi. I've been spoiled by the functional uh, infrastructure of, a, of, of Finland. I was tempted to start um, this talk with, a, with an introduction to media studies and a kind of explanation of, of where it would go. And then I spun off about three other possible uh, lectures. I decided to spare you that. But just let me say a word um, about media studies, which is a many splendored field. Um, it crosses the humanities and the social sciences, broadly understood. It can also stray into economics and today even perhaps into meteorology. Um, the field of media studies has many origins, depending on the story uh, you're telling. Um, of course, when academics start telling stories about their fields, they do this thing which is called giving birth to your ancestors, um, in which they like to invent imaginary lineages for their noble past, quite like nations do uh, for themselves. But it is true that media studies you can trace in a variety of forms to late 19th century sociology, and the concern for community in the modern world, most particularly associated with the Chicago School of Sociology, um, to the Frankfurt School, with its interest in modern culture industry, um, the ways that uh, industrial forms have ideological effects and often ideological abuse, to the Columbia School, which is very interested in media effects, particularly short-term media effects, on um, people's attitudes, behavior, cognitions, um, and with the great discovery, of course, being uh, interpersonal uh, influence. <laughs> My wife's taking a picture of me. I, I should get used to this media effect. Um, it happens quite frequently. Um, you have, um, of course, British cultural studies um, with its interest in subculture and popular resistance. And of course, people like Innes, who I've already mentioned, Marshall and, and Marshall uh, McLuhan with an interest in the technological infrastructures. Of communication. So many splendid field, rainbow uh, of interests, 
historically the objects of media studies have been the newspaper, radio, film, television, popular literature and music, and advertising. Uh, media studies has historically been deeply tied up with the cultural projects of democracy and building a common culture. And the public sphere has, has lain at the heart of what media studies is. Now, media studies as an intellectual project and field came into being in the heyday of the mass media. Um, and mass media, let's see if we can do this right. Mass media has, a, has, has great environments. Okay. It's a double PowerPoint, so you, so you can see this. I'm not sure why, why the fish are eating that. <laughs> Does anyone know why, why I have double blue arrows on that? No, this is not part of the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Pretend it's the fish connoisseurs um, enjoying the, uh, the, uh, the water. Okay, so media studies emerged in, in the heyday of mass media, radio, television, film, newspapers, magazines. News, um, media which were produced centrally for large audiences, often on a national basis, with heavily capitalized uh, in industries. This was the model in which mass media uh, emerged. For someone like Marshall McLuhan, the mission of media studies was to expose the environments in which we lived, unreflectively. He famously thought that we, with regard to, to media environments, such as electricity, were like fish in water. Uh, completely uninformed about the existence of water. Seems kind of like an absurd idea. It seems like fish would actually know um, a lot about water, uh, such as these uh, New Yorker fish who are connoisseurs of, uh, of uh, water. So media studies, as I said, took form in the middle of the 20th century. But nobody saw the computer coming. Um, in the 50s and 60s, uh, the computer was left to a few far out cyberneticians and philosophers. And it was only in the 1970s and 80s that scholars in Germany started to think of the computer as a medium. And German media studies remains the world gold standard for this kind of thinking and has revolutionized media theory. And it's just starting to, starting to spread uh, more thoroughly up beyond the bounds of, a, of, of Germany. But the digital advent, the coming of computers, um, it, in all of their uh, diverse forms and uh, devices has brought about a change in the field of media studies as radical as changes in the media industries themselves. Everybody knows that digitization has shaken up every field of human endeavor and probably lots of fields of non-human endeavor as well. What does digitization mean? I think this is a question all of us would like to figure out because it affects really everything that we do as scholars, as citizens, as consumers, in our everyday modes, as friends, as music listeners, as gardeners, as people who live on a planet with limited supplies of oxygen, who have to show up to rooms with limited supplies of oxygen. I mean, there are lots of ways in which digital media are the absolute infrastructures of our being. And so trying to uh, figure this, uh, this out, I mean, there are hypotheses about digital media that are just about as ubiquitous as digital devices uh, themselves. How should we think about the future of the newspaper, for example? The nature of democracy, the liberty to create culture with so-called user-generated content, or as it often actually is in practice, loser-generated content. Um, <laughs> how should we think about the nature of the historical record? Uh, who owns data? I, I think Angela Merkel is asking this question uh, right now. She had a conversation with uh, Mr. Obama yesterday about the security of her cell phone. Seems that somebody's been listening in. Um, what is the nature of sociability at a distance? What does it mean that we now conduct uh, a lot of our sociability? We, rich industrialized people, um, or post-industrialized people, conduct much of our sociability online. I recently read that the average American produces more words with their fingertips than with their voice box every day in terms of, a, of a, a production. So I will engage, I promise. It's a necessary part of being a media scholar to say something grandiose and slightly outrageous. And so I will engage later on some speculation on the meaning of digital devices. But I'd like to start with the past something which is easier to make sense of. Now, I'm not deluded in thinking that the past is something which stays still. 
I'm actually quite fond of the saying, some of you will know this, that Russia is a country with a dynamic past. I mean, uh, I just flubbed the, uh, the uh, an unpredictable past. Sorry, I flubbed the punchline, I hate that. Russia is a country with an unpredictable past. Well, it's true of lots of, lots of countries. The past isn't necessarily something which, uh, which stays in, in place. But still, one of the great things about studying uh, the past is that it's a hype puncture. And there's nothing more full of hype than new media. And um, new media have been held to be revolutionary since the printing press, which I'll talk about for a minute, or writing um, itself. And even within real revolutions, media are often held up to, uh, to be revolutionary. Now, it's clear that Twitter, Facebook, and so on have had various roles in the so-called Arab Spring, which wasn't really in spring, because they don't have that, or it wasn't really Arab, because it was Iran as well. But anyway, who cares? Um, <laughs> when you actually look at the so-called Twitter revolution and Facebook revolutions, you discover that it isn't the new media making revolutions happening. They're facilitating deeper social networks, which are based on cold face-to-face -face, um, connections of affiliation. You're not going to go die or risk your life in tougher square because someone sends you a Facebook message. I'm sorry. Um, so there's there's a, a, a lot of hype which is use uh, which is useful for us to uh, try to puncture. And something which I'd like to uh, particularly try to puncture is this idea that these new media have replaced so-called old media. It's a common saying to hear people talk about television, um, the large circulation newspaper, national cinema, as if they were old media. No, they were old media. They're, they were mass media. Um, old media are things like pyramids, census, writing. I mean, every form of, of culture and civilization <coughs> has processed data and has had to process data. So the history of media is actually very ancient. This is a great point from, from uh, Harold Innes, that wherever you have concentrated power, you have palaces, temples, and markets, you're going to have data processing, you're going to have control over space and time, you're going to have media devices which uh, enable this this uh, processing uh, to, to uh, happen. So what the 20th century had were mass media, which were, in terms of the broad scale of history, are actually quite rare. Um, what new media indeed have is a continuity with ancient media. If you look at writing, which I'm going to get to um, in a minute, I mean, writing was originally a device of computation, of calculation, of accounting and accounting, of biopower in the most literal sense. In Mesopotamia, counting up bread and beer and labor. I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's a device of inventory of, of people and uh, property way before it was a means for uh, re uh, recording poetry. Um, new media are also data processors at their heart. And so this is, this is actually an interesting continuity in, in the deep history of, of media, that new media um, so-called new media, dig digital media, reveal something deep about civilizational media in general. Now, of course, there are things which are distinctly new about digital media. Trying to figure out the ratio of the new and old is always something, uh, something very, uh, very complicated. But mass media had as their mission the provision of content, of programming, of news, of drama, of entertainment. Um, Digital media, in fact, have a much more logistical role. But what they provide are services. They provide organization, time, space, calendar, mail, money, um, um, or, uh, organization. I mean, one, little, one little indication of this shift away, I think, from, from mass media happened in Finland in 2013 that you don't have a television tax anymore. You have a Ulysses Radio tax. I mean, you have I mean the uh, Finnish broadcasting company because it, I mean the tax has to be disentangled from any any particular media media platform. It's not just not just a uh, TV. So, in some sense, new media take us back to the status quo, uh, the historical status quo, in which some people talk to some people, few people talk to um, one person, one person talks to one person and one person talks to nobody, which is probably the historical norm for communication in general. <laughs> as it is for most blogs, in fact. One to none communication is an, is, is an important kind. And 
and instead of centrally mass-produced content, which are which is spread uh, for everybody, we are back to the historical norm where there's still dominant ideologies, dominant narratives, cultures, things which, which give shape to to social life. I mean, there's still cultural containers of all kinds, but it's it's a lot more fluid and squishy and a, and a plural. So new media do not take us into uncharted waters. They revive the most basic problems of living together in complex societies. And digital media cast the oldest troubles of civilization into relief. So let's start with a surprising place, something about the history of uh, civilizational media. And I mentioned the uh, market, palace, and temple as three key social forms in which you can see media evolving. Here, I mean, I'm going to focus mostly on the uh, temple because, indeed, much of the interest in media history can be traced through looking at religious media. So, paper. Let's think about the meta metaphysics of, of, of paper. In the three great book religions of the Western world, the ethical monotheisms of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, we should really call them media religions, in fact, because for each of them, there is something of the sacred experience is tied up with media forms, whether they are texts like the Torah, which Gershom Scholem is talking about here, the one object which could be apprehended by man in its absolute state in a world where all other things are relative. This is a kind of text metaphysics in which the text supersedes the universe because it is the universe uh, in, uh, in uh, some ways. Um, you have a similar notion floating around in Christianity with the idea of the Book of Life, with Christ, the Pantocrator, the ruler of all, whose rule is guaranteed by his power over accounting, uh, keeping track, you know, tagging, we would call it. Tagging and, uh, yeah, poking, maybe not poking. Yeah, that happens, but yeah tagging um, everything that everybody has done. And the books will be open, and, and according to the, to the narrative, everybody will be judged, because everything will be found um, in these books. A similar idea is, is found with the, in, in the Norman conquest of England, with the well-named Doomsday Book, which is, in fact, a survey of property, because you want to do a census of who owns what, so you can tax them. Um, taxation, bookkeeping, um, census. I mean, there, there are lots of very interesting uh, numerical techniques of accounting and counting which are central to religious and the state power. That's, that's very obvious. Why is it called the Doomsday Book? Well, the Day of Judgment is a day of accounting, where you're called for to give your account to uh, explain the, uh, the inventory. Maybe one of the best examples, or one of the best um, um, sayings, which recent German media theorists loved, um, loved the saying, was it's actually Ferdinand and Isabella, the, the Reyes Catolicos in, in, in Spain, who started this, apparently. It's not ancient Latin, but uh, medieval Latin, but quote, non est in actis, non est in mundo. In other words, if it's not on file, it doesn't exist. Um, okay, it, it says, if it's not in the files, it is not in the world. Um, this is an attitude very familiar to anyone who's ever been around university administration. <laughs> um, I was a department chair for three years, and we all know the sort of documentary attitude, which prevails not only in, in a university uh, administration. Philip was a very interesting king for all kinds of reasons, because he presided over Spain at the moment of its historic, historically most vast geographic extent. And Philip was an innovator because um, instead of the typical medieval entourage in which the king would go on, the king or queen would go on, on the road, show off the royal power throughout the country through parades and pilgrimages, he decided to stay in Madrid and instead have his empire come to him. And his empire came to him in paper. And uh, Philip's nickname was El Rey Papelero, the paper king as he adored documents. And anyone who's been around Spain also knows that it's a country which loves, uh, loves uh, bureaucracy. It's almost comic when you read the history of the conquest of Mexico by Bernal Diaz, where Cor Cortez goes in 
and before he'll start at attacking the Aztecs, he will read the requisite three times in Latin the decree that he is going to fight them so it can be a just war. And then it's, it's properly witnessed and annotated so that, yeah, everything's, everything's ready, uh, ready, ready to rumble. Um, and this actually, 16th century Spanish media have been very interestingly described in a book by Bernard Siegert called Passage des Digitalen, or The Digital Passage, in which he talks about the ways that you can actually see um, the project here, which Philip and others had of building a Padron Real, or a royal register, actually uh, foreshadows Google's project in, in, in many ways of trying to create the uh, mind of God, which would uh, hold, hold everything. Now, Babbage we don't think of as a particularly uh, uh, religious figure. He is one of the founders of, of uh, computing, um, mathematician, extremely interesting character. Um, in, indeed, there are lots of, of the figures who are key to the history of computing with deep theological interest. Pascal, Leibniz, Boole. But Babbage, in um, his ninth Bridgewater Treatise, which was the Bridgewater Treatises were funded by the Earl of Bridgewater as defenses of natural uh, religion, Babbage said some really incredible stuff. Babbage was a friend of uh, Laplace, the uh, mathematician. Laplace transformed that uh, Laplace who had the vision that if you could know where every particle in the universe was and know its its direction, you could predict everything uh, the, the, that would ever happen. So this is what, what Babbage says about the atmosphere. Okay, be thinking cloud here. Thus considered, what a strange chaos is this white atmosphere we breathe. Every atom, impressed with good and with ill, retains at once the motions which philosophers and sages have imparted to it, mixed and combined in 10,000 ways with all that is worthless and base. The air itself is one vast library on whose pages are forever written all that man has ever said or woman whispered. I think there's some gender something going on there. <laughs> there, in their mutable but unerring characters, mixed with the earliest as well as with the latest size of mortality, stand forever recorded, vows unredeemed, promises unfulfilled, perpetuating in the united movements of each particle the testimony of man's changeful will. But if the air we breathe is the never-failing historian of the sentiments we have uttered, Earth, air, and ocean are the eternal witnesses of the acts we have done. So it's really quite, quite beautiful that nature itself is a recording medium. And this is familiar to you from science fiction, the idea that if you could outspeed light, you could kind of move back in time and capture everything that was happening. It's 2001, the Space Odyssey tropes off of this. But here's, I mean, this is way before Google. I mean, it, it, this idea of, of, of a text or a documentation which would be found in the leafy fabrics, Babbage said, of plants. The leafy fabrics of plants are themselves, think about paper, uh, are themselves documents which uh, contain everything that has that is, uh, ever happened. And so let's think more uh, particularly of, uh, about paper. I've, I've talked a bit about uh, the metaphysics of writing, a vision of writing which would persist, which could be found in the sacred text, to the air itself, to the mind of God, uh, a kind of writing which would control everything and which would uh, contain everything. But if we think more particularly about paper as a medium, of course one of the great theorists of paper, historians of paper, was Innes, who as a Canadian was very upset about the way that <coughs> the uh, Canadian tree forest would get chopped down, turned into paper pulp, by, um, and then printed in the United States, um, and then imported back into Canada with text arguing for laissez-faire economics, which would allow all of Canada's forests to be chopped down. And so I mean, this is a kind of ironic way that um, we, we had a kind of abuse of natural resources and of political resources. Um, in a famously, said of himself. I don't know if you know Innes, very interesting character. Um, he said early on in his, his life he realized that there were two paths open to him. There was either scholarship or politics. And he said, of course, I, of, of course I chose politics. 
Because if you read Ennis, you can see he's a profoundly uh, political thinker. There's a nice chair. Please, please come in. Or there's another chair. So, so Ennis was interested, uh, very interested in the uh, politics and the uh, materiality of, of, of paper. And one of his uh, points was a well-known one that he made, McLuhan made, many other people, Elizabeth Eisenstein, have made sense about the role of paper in producing national language and national identity. So this is the Luther Bible, or actually more relevant for our context here, is obviously that uh, kind of founding moment in Finnish nationalism is the Agricola uh, translation of the Bible into uh, Finnish. So paper is, is a context which enables a national imaginary, a national imagination, imagined communities, and Benedict Anderson's famous phrase. Um, in some sense, throughout Protestant countries uh, from the mid-16th century onward, you basically had a common television program every Sunday morning. I should say television program, a common broadcast in which the uh, text was, was the same, the Bible. But of course, being Protestants, they did very interesting and divisive things with that text. Yeah, if you know British cultural studies, you can see that there's their distant ancestors of Protestantism and their love of how people anarchically will twist and, and tear texts to their pieces. Okay, um, another interesting historical thing um, about paper is this, and it connects with the metaphysics of writing, which I was uh, talking about, is this deep connection between the book and the body. Many people have, have written it um, about the ways that bodies and texts seem to overlap, even at the, the, their most gruesome level of using human skin as an object of printing, which actually goes back way before the Nazis. The Nazis were famous for doing this, but the 19th century you had books that were bound in a human skin. So this is actually the oldest reputation, uh, representation that we know of, of the printing press. Um, a, a, it's a dance macabre, a, a dance of the dead, in which uh, the printing press seems to have let loose the dead to dance around. And this again is, is one of the classic tropes of writing, the metaphysics of writing, that, that writing stores the voice. That, that when you have a written medium, you are able to put the dead and the living into contact uh, with each other. Let me give it um, a, another example of text as an embodied creature. This, of course, is the famous defense um, of unlicensed printing by John Milton. <clears throat> Second greatest English poet. Um, who kills a man kills a reasonable creature, God's image. But he who destroys a good book kills reason itself, kills the image of God as it were in the eye. Now, I'm not exactly sure how to read this. I don't think Milton's saying it's better to kill somebody than to censor a book. And Milton is not afraid of overstatement. Um, and Areopagitica, contrary, if you actually read it, is a very gory text. There are bodies being hacked to pieces all over the place in it. But um, you know, here's this idea that, that a book is the eye or the mind of God, something which is alive and embodied in a, some, some, some way. Heinrich Heine had a, had a similar thought. Um, there where books are burnt, there quickly people are burnt as well. Um, you know, Heine is writing this in the um, early to mid 19th century, but unfortunately it's, it's quite accurately predicted. There's something about the connection between the ways that we treat books and the ways that we treat bodies and are, are connected. The first bit of advice I got about being in Finland was is that when somebody gives you your card, their card, you have to treat it well because the way that you treat their card is an index of the way that you treat them. So the paper is a kind of extension of the body, and that's not um, a totally outrageous idea. Um, along with paper, so this is, this is my long narrative of generalities um, about papers, uh, about paper's civilizational um, effects, you, you get a certain vision of interiority. Um, suited for democratic life. This, of course, is um, Vermeer, um, a, girl, um, a girl reading a, a letter by the window, and uh, 
Gerhard Richter's copy of it later, but, but the idea is that the reader is one who is able to interiorize, to reason. Habermas famously talks about audience-oriented subjectivity, or inner the that, that, that the reader is able to uh, create worlds inside. The historians of novels tell us about Puritan diary keeping and introspection as the early origin for, uh, for, for, for novels. And so it's clear that literary practice is a, is a form of self-making. So not just body-making, but mind-making. Finally, the uh, newspaper, of course. I mean, that, this idea that text, print culture, produces um, a public sphere. I don't think it was said any better ever than by John Stuart Mill in Considerations on Representative Government. And the question, of course, which is the question of all early modern democratic theorists, was the problem of scale. That is, ancient democracy was always small, but it's always a question of, of city-states. Modern democracy, if you're going to uh, confine it to a city-state, it's not, it's not going to work. So how do you make it work? Well, Mill's answer is the newspaper. Um, you know, in the ancient world, you could not have regulated popular government beyond the bounds of a single city community because there did not exist the physical conditions for the formation and propagation of public opinion. <coughs> but to surmount it completely required the press and even the newspaper press, the real equivalent, though not in all respects an adequate one, of the Panix and the Forum. So the Panix, or the ancient Greeks, uh, gathered Panica in modern Athens, some of you might have visited or the uh, uh, Roman Forum. So here, here the newspaper is an answer to the problem of scale, to the problem of how you make a modern <coughs> democracy extend to the bounds of the nation state without um, devolving into military tyranny. Because in, since Caesar, since Alexander, it was clear that once you got beyond the uh, nation state, you could not have democratic uh, control. I mean, <coughs> uh, and this is the great problem, of course, which, uh, Montesquieu first for, uh, puts, puts on the table for modern democracy. So let's just think about paper here for a minute. I've talked about some of the large, large claims about um, ways to think um, about its impact on the ways we think about record keeping, ways to think about God, the way we think about self, the way we think about the public sphere. Um, Lippmann, by the way, Walter Lippmann, the great American journalist, said that the newspaper is the Bible of democracy. And you can see how, I mean, he's not a, a religious figure, but you can see how that trope fits right into this lineage of, of a world text which uh, contains everything. Well, this is, to, to me, this is a, a very, quite an amazing little uh, story. If you look at historical statistics, a paper produced in, in the United States from 1809 to 18. 99. This is in 1,000 metric tons. So essentially you start off with nothing. You end up with a lot. By 2000 you have, you know, obviously it keeps going uh, in a massive amounts. But I think it's a good question we should ask ourselves. is what is the key substance for industrialization? Is it coal or is it cellulose? Um, obviously carbon is actually at the core of uh, industrializing uh, processes, but it's clear that um, industrial society needs paper just as much as, as it needs, needs fuel. Paper consumption is just as unequal globally as is any other uh, valued resource. Um, North America and Japan um, use annually, on average, about twice as much as Europe or Oceania, five times as much as Latin America or Russia, and nearly 20 times as much as Russia. And the world is radically uneven in its distribution. That's no news to anybody in this room, but that paper is part of it is an, is, is an interesting uh, point. Uh, it's well known, you can see that in terms of newspapers per thousand literacy rate that, uh, that the Nordic countries lead, um, well known, that, um, but it's, um, I think I lost a page. Who cares? <laughs> we will manage. Yes. So, along comes the internet, and you can see that I sort of skipped the 20th century, which is a <laughs> slight problem. <laughs> but we can, uh, it, I did talk some, something about mass media, and I'd love to talk about mass media. They're endlessly interesting. But since the point of this lecture is to try to connect paper and clouds, 
to try to connect new and old, or older um, at least, that's justifying something, hopefully a justification for this slip. Um, images of the internet are interesting in the ways that they often look like the Big Bang, or they look like brains, um, or they look like networks of uh, some sort. This is a famous older image of the internet. Hillary Clinton, the famous communication theorist, said um, <laughs> the internet is the iconic infrastructure of, of our time. And by iconic, she didn't mean like purse icon in like symbols. She meant, you know, leading, you know, the dominant, uh, the most notable infrastructure of our time. And it's pretty interesting to think about the internet as something like the Roman Corsus Publicus or the 19th century building of, of railroads and telegraphs and, and underwater cables because it's an odd mixture of the material and of the symbolic in a way that traditional infrastructures, which always had a symbolic dimension for sure, I mean, yeah, the, trans the transoceanic cable is a big feather in the cap of the British Empire. I mean, that's, that's well known. I'm not saying that you can ha do anything human without having a symbolic aspect. But with the internet, so much more of it is, has to do with, the, with a cultural uh, infrastructure, which is obviously also material. I don't like this idea that culture is not material. Um, so what does this mean for, for paper? This is... Um, Thank you, Yanni Akhtiainen, who found, found me very interesting data about the Finnish uh, uh, forestry and paper industry. Well, it's finally happened. What people have been predicting since the 70s, paper usage has dropped. You know, the paperless office, ha, ha, ha. People predicted that in the 70s. I mean, personal computers raised paper consumption. Well-known uh, well fact. But you can see that um, Declining use of paper for print and for books or for um, newspapers is made up by packing material because we have the internet to deliver you all kinds of pro products. And for me, it's, it's symbolically apt that your latest electronic digital gadget always comes wrapped in paper with printing all over it. And it's just like, you know, the that it isn't that a new medium contains the old medium, but the old medium contains the new medium. I mean, it, it literally wraps this, uh, the, this old medium. So the timber industry is struggling, but it's finding ways to make things work. Um, paper can also turn into art. Um, and my colleague Garrett, Garrett Stewart at the University of Iowa has a really wonderful book about the de demediation of books in which he talks about this gigantic proliferation of book art in, uh, in the age of the Kindle. When you actually gut books of their supposed content and you make books into things that you can supposedly carry around without any effect on, on, on your e-readers, the, the books as objects become art forms because dead, ancient, old, belated, obsolescing media always become material and fresh and interesting. This is apparently on view in, in the public library in Prague. I haven't seen it. Is anyone? Is a, a, a Slovakian artist. That's really cool. And, and you can step inside of, of this. That's how, how big it is. So, yeah. Paper, something happens with uh, paper. It won't die. It'll become packaging. It'll become art. And I don't think folks are ever going to die. But we can talk about that later. Let's think about Google for um, a minute. If we want to think about um, one of the most representative and indicative media corporations of our moment. I think you'd have to choose Google. I mean, you could go with Facebook, you could go with, uh, go with Apple, I mean, there are lots of ways you can pick any other sexy startup that you want to think about. But Google, in lots of ways, is, a, is captures this connection between the new and the old media, particularly in its project to replicate the mind of God, which Sergey Brin uh, one of the co-founders of Google went sort of tossed off with a slight error of Kabbalah. That, that, that was the point of it. The true search engine would replicate the, uh, the uh, mind of God. Um, and you know, the idea that Google somehow is God is the ground of our being. I, I could have found lots of funny slides to show you, but I'm, I'm going to spare you just, just one. But it is ubiquitous online. If there are uh, sermons given in churches which, you know, the, you know, the burden of the sermon will be, Google does not have all the answers. 
a little bit of competition there, I suppose. A little bit of, yeah, when you get disintermediated, you're going to fight back, and the churches are upset about Google taking their claim on, on Ultimate. I mean, think about every search that has ever been done on Google is archived. Absolutely every search. And the subsequent click stream, as they call it, has been archived. Think about what is found in this data, data set. I mean, what an archive of failed marriages and terrorist plots and romances and, you know, plagiarized homework and you name it. I mean, it's, it's there. I mean, the, the, the sort of record of a lot of human action and uh, desire is found on this book of life. So let's just do a little bit of basics about Google. The key thing about Google, if you can compare it with 20th century mass media, Google does not produce programming. Of course, it has its secret algorithm. It's as secret as the Coca-Cola recipe. But I mean, Google doesn't produce, I mean, it's, it's, I know it's, it bought YouTube, and I mean, there, there are ways you can see it as a content provider. But what Google provides is logistical services. Translation, mail, search, above all, um, money, um, so on and so on, books, of course. Um, PageRank is a logic of, of the network, and it, um, it's explicitly modeled on the library. It's a bibliometric system. Oh. Yeah, I don't want to belabor this, but the, the simple way to understand PageRank is to, uh, to ask a question with everybody in this room, because you've been around professors or are a professor will understand. Professors really love to read, yeah? But more than reading, they love to write. They agree, but more than writing, they love to publish, <laughs> yeah? But more than publishing, they like to be read. But even more than liking to be read, they like to be cited. Right? And who do they like to be cited by? They want to be cited by somebody with a lot of citations. Isn't that true? I mean, you want Judith Butler to cite you. Yeah. In, in, in John Peter's recent work, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yes. In, in other words, this is the exact logic that, that PageRank, that Google uses for tracking internet. Um, structure. They, they don't look at keywords, they look at the structure of the network, and it's a co-citation system. So it's very clear that there's a kind of bibliometric logic of co-citation analysis, which is built into a, to a Google, which is so that there's, there's the papery legacy there. Unlike the papery legacy, though, it does not organize the library for you. The Dewey Decimal System from the 1870s, if, if you look up a number in a, on the Dewey Decimal System, it tells you what the book is about and where in the library you can find it. Dewey Decimal Library Organization changed the furniture and the architecture of the library. Google does not change the architecture or the furniture of the internet because it indexes it. It, it, it goes out and tracks it with its spiders. But its point is not the underlying organization of the internet which is uh, rearranged but, but the uh, bits of, of, of data. It builds a padrón real, a kind of royal register, as the 16th Spaniards wanted it. <coughs> There's money in logistics. Yeah. Um, in some sense, Google, this is going to sound excessive, but Google is the ground of being, at least for the, for, for the internet. This is how people access the uh, internet. Um, and we can talk more about what that means. So let me speculate for a minute a bit about um, just what this all means. Um, yeah, why can't you look someone in the eye on Skype? Have you notice this? I mean, Skype pretends to be interaction, but you need really fancy equipment to look somebody in the eye because the camera's up here and their eyes are down here. Um, what we need instead of Facebook is Footbook where we actually get together and look at each other's shoes. Because this is what people do. And it's not, I'm not making a joke about Finnish conversational style. So I, I, I don't mean that, but people get together and their shoes matter. They check each other out with their shoes. It's something that we do as animals. Our feet in the same place at the same time. There's something ethologically powerful about being together. And the feet are completely lost in cyberspace. And I've got a bigger argument about why that's important. What is presence in cyberspace? 
Okay, why is it that when you go to a, a concert, you just can't enjoy the music? You need to tell someone else you're at the concert and share it. Um, you know, what is, where is the real? I mean, quote, non est in actis, non est in, in mundo. My students tell me that a romantic relationship is not real until it has gone Facebook. So it has to be certified on Facebook. You have to be in a relationship with, um, or the relationship is not real. The, the text supersedes the reality. You know, the Torah is greater than the universe. Google is, is the real. In some ways, are you real at the concert, or are you real because somebody at a distance is, is a listening in? Other questions. I mean, we have all of this hype um, about um, you know the internet has greater emancipation, um, and you know hacking is a really interesting thing which we should uh, talk about. You know, I have to my anarchist heart sort of um, loves loves what anonymous does. Sometimes and other times I'm kind of really distressed about the juvenile stupidity of of, of, of it. Um, how should we think about secrecy and surveillance and uh, hacking? Um, John Keane, the Australian political theorist, says that Julian Assange is the Tom Paine of our time. Jimmy Carter calls Edward Snowden um, a hero. Um, I, mean, I think a lot of people would probably agree with that. I mean, Obama fiercely said, oh, this is going to have no effect on anything. Uh -huh. and it's, and he's, he's clearly uh, responding. Bradley, Chelsea, Manning. Um, you know, the internet is clearly not this utopia where everybody is free and everything is happy. These, these people remind me of the principle that we all know from basketball or soccer. That it's the second person who, re who responds to the foul who gets the yellow card. Right? These people actually spotted a foul and they're the ones who get called for the foul. But, okay, this is a, a picture that I took in China of my laptop. I decided I'd do an innocent little search for Dalai Lama. <laughs> and guess what happened? Safari so can't open the page because the server unexpectedly dropped the connection. This sometimes, sometimes, you can say, occurs when the server is busy. Wait a few minutes and then try again. I tried again. I tried Taiwan. I tried Tiananmen. I tried Falun Gong. It kept dropping so unexpectedly. <laughs> and you know, one of the things which we can see is that I mean, hacking has this aura, this ethos of bottom-up, you know, heroes, you know, resistance hero. But it's clear that one of the greatest hackers on the earth is the Chinese state, and that the Chinese state has figured out how to use the internet instead of shutting it down as a way to keep tabs on people. The internet is a great tracking device. So if you give people some oxygen to talk and to organize, you can actually spy on them better. Okay, last question. You know about Snapchat? Snapchat is this new startup company on the right which um, allows you to send self-destructing pictures. And you can actually set whether the picture will last from 1 to 10 seconds. Um, 10 seconds is the maximum time that you can send, send this picture because there are pictures which people want to send which they don't want to have memorialized um, forever. And there are lots of actually very tragic cases of, of especially teenage girls who have sent nude pictures of themselves, who, and those pictures then go viral and circulate, and they, there are several suicides that have uh, followed uh, from, from this. And so what happens to the historical record in a time in which, you know, my students are convinced that anything they put online lasts forever. Um, I'm not convinced of that at all. I think in 100 years that the 20th century will, will be better documented than the early 21st. Because I don't see anybody really figuring out how to store all of our digital stuff for the, for the long haul. Even though we're obsessively documenting everything, um, I'm not convinced that, that it's going to last. Okay, I have to get the clouds. But I'll do clouds and conclude. So what a strange idea, this idea of cloud storage. Why is it that when I say cloud, people think internet? Why do you think clouds? Like, meteorological clouds. Think about the sort of ideology, the ideology of this pervasive metaphor, as if computers were such green media. Do you have any idea how much, how, how much the electrical grid costs in terms of carbon? I mean, it's, it's well known that 
one to three percent of the American electrical bill is spent on, I mean, total electrical bill is spent on server farms, on keeping servers open because, you know, Google, Facebook, people want 24-hour servers, 24-7, and so there's a tremendous amount of wasted energy which gets put into uh, producing, you know, cost this this cloud. So the you know, cloud is actually quite quite carbon full. But can we think about clouds for a minute? Um, so there's this idea, I mean, real clouds. So carbon cloud storage, sorry, carbon storage, yes, cloud storage too. Cloud storage has become a pervasive metaphor for computing as a utility. That that it's a public utility like like television or or um, water. But the idea that the heavens store meaning is actually a rather ancient, ancient one. So is there, are, are the clouds communicating in this picture? Is there something there? Um, this is an image from the British Cloud Appreciation Society. <laughs> and they, they published an actually quite beautiful coffee table book consisting of, it's called Clouds That Look Like Things. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's a poodle or a polar bear, I guess. How about this? <laughs> is it? It's definitely communicating. It's definitely communicating. And it's a, it's a fish, an old airplane, submarine. Uh, it's an old airplane. I don't know. The idea that the clouds have, have, have something to say, that the heavens are full of, of meaning, is a very old one. Friedrich Kittler, probably the key German media theorist, quips that weather and the gods are always very difficult to tell apart from each other. Um, and it's, yes, that's the uh, next slide here. So when uh, there's a meteor trail, which uh, the, the meteor which landed in Chelyabinsk in uh, Russia, there was a leader of the Orthodox Church who said, this is a warning from God. Um, he actually said we should read it as a warning from God, which is hermeneutically more correct. And it's so good. He was a good monitor to say we should read it as, instead of saying it was a warning from our God. But he, um, he got a lot of derision from people saying clouds don't mean anything. You know, things in the sky don't mean anything. You cannot read the sky as having any uh, particular meaning. Now, the greatest theorist of clouds in the 19th century was John Ruskin. And he said a cloud is a mixture of something and nothing. And this is it's so beautiful. I just can't stand it. A cloud is a mixture of something and nothing. It's like being itself, a mixture of something and nothing. Um, and Ruskin was a great theorist, of, I mean, a great critic of cloud painters. Clouds were a quintessential romantic object in poetry, painting, um, poetry and painting in particular. John Constable is the greatest cloud painter, probably. But what's interesting about cloud painting, as Hubert de Miche, the French art historian has pointed out, is that when you paint clouds, you defy representation. Because there's something about the act of drawing something which is ephemeral, fluid, edge-free, which defies the traditional norms of painting. It doesn't have edges. It's not an object. It's not something which, which you can paint in a way. This is actually um, a reflection. Um, yeah. So other beautiful. Right? If, if you know Richter's work, that one of the things you see here is that it looks like a cloud and it looks like a Richter. It's quite, quite amazing. Um, most recently, uh, the, the, the Dutch artist Bernhard Smilda has been creating clouds in art spaces. His medium really is photography, but he will go into art, art museums or interior spaces and produce clouds. And it, you can find him uh, producing clouds. And I think that this is kind of a great metaphor of what clouds are uh, in our time, is that they're a mixture of something and nothing, or that they're a mixture of nature and culture. Do you really think that the weather is something which has no meaning? Do you think that the weather is something which ha is completely unaffected by human activity? Do you think it's really fruitful anymore to, to be saying that the, that the sky has no meaning, that we should stop trying to read meanings there? Farmers, pilots, and sailors would just think it was nuts anyway, because they've been reading the, uh, the sky forever. There's a great little moment in the New Testament in which some people approach Jesus and say, give us a sign in the sky. 
And he says, you want a, sky, a sign in the sky? I'll give you one. If it's red at night, then you'll have good weather tomorrow. And if it's red in the morning, then you have to watch out for a storm coming. A very brutally sarcastic answer. But he was basically saying, yeah, meteorology is how clouds talk to us. Now, meteorology, I want to submit to you, is actually a question of media. And this is where you really have to fasten your seatbelt for the last, like, four minutes. Because there's a little bit of turbulence. That's what clouds do. Um, you know, the ability to see clouds from both sides, both sides now, as Joni Mitchell's saying in a great treatise on clouds, depends radically upon optical media. First ability, I mean, mountains, you could see clouds from, from on top for thousands of years. But with the Montgolfier brothers in the late 18th century, you could actually start to see clouds as objects um, from uh, both sides. With the space exploration, especially with satellite, uh, photography, clouds become objects of scientific knowledge and representation. Now, clouds have been tremendously elusive to science. I mean, the effort to produce a cloud atlas has failed. I mean, Lorraine Dastin is, is, is writing and has written very interesting work upon the ways that trying to come up with a taxonomy of clouds, which is similar to a taxonomy of plants or animals, you cannot do it because the being of clouds is somehow different. Is somehow, I mean, it's statistical, it's probabilistic. Um, people who do animation know that the hardest thing to represent are water and clouds. I mean, I mean, it's incredibly difficult to represent these fractal fluid beings. And it's not until you have the 19th century, you even have the possibility, thanks to fluid dynamics, of having any kind of science of clouds or meteorology. Um, by the by the 1990s, it becomes possible to predict weather with some degree of accuracy. And it becomes possible to see the Earth as covered with clouds. Indeed, this is something that the Americans discovered in the Cold War, is that their surveillance planes couldn't see through clouds when they want to take pictures of the Soviet Union. So they had to figure out how to predict when clouds are there and when they're not there. And so weather forecasting is actually an abuse of Army equipment. Uh, it's, a, it's a helpful spin-off from a military technology. I need to find my last page. You've been very patient. We are almost there. Do you, you really want to say that clouds have no meaning? I mean, this, of course, is a cloud which has a lot of historical meaning, uh, which suggested at a point, let's hope it's over, the potential end of the human species. Let's think about an, another set of clouds. Um, and since we're in the north, it melted Arctic ice, and weather, I mean, climate change also predicts a potential um, for the end of the human species as we know it. Uh, so we end with a funny uh, reversal. 35 years ago, Jean-François Lyotard said, data banks are nature for postmodern man, postmodern people. Um, and he was talking about how that's it, very much a kind of proto-Google uh, kind of argument. So data has become nature, and the clouds have become culture. How did it happen that we saw the clouds of all places as some place we would invest our most precious storage in? I mean, this is really something which is very, very a antique, to, to read the sky as the place where, where your deepest aspirations and uh, culture is found. So I want to conclude by suggesting, in our age, media mean something more than dispensers of programs or industries of news or drama, as important and essential as they are. They also mean the modes and means by which we exist between heaven and earth. Media span the nature and culture divide. We live, breathe, and have our being in media. The old idea that media are environments can be flipped. Environments are also media. Water, earth, fire, and sky are elements that sustain existence. In, the, in an age called the Anthropocene by many, the cloud, the data cloud, and the carbon cloud have something profound to do with each other. Media studies is a field that ha has as its task to figure out exactly what they have to do with each other. Thank you very much for your patience.
much drawn to this excellent thought provoking lecture. We now have some half an hour, right? Three minutes for this is the best part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so questions and answers. So we would like to, to begin. There. Yes, please. Yes. Thank you. Mark This was a very uh, um, different way to look at uh, new media. Thank you. Very refreshing. I think um, I would like to pose a little comment or question or whatever on this metaphor of cloud. Now, for me, it's just a, a free association because I've started thinking about this uh, idea of why is cloud associated with, with, with this kind of uh, storage of internet content or something. Wouldn't one key for this uh, use of this sort of quite strange metaphor uh, have to do with the, with the fact that who are um, advancing this, this sort of uh, metaphors and, and, and who are responsible for, for using this sort of yeah. In media studies, one interesting uh, uh, related example would be the metaphor of galaxy, which was, which was used by McLuhan in, in his book, Gutenberg Galaxy, and later by the hair of McLuhan and I guess Mayor Castles in his book, Internet Galaxy. Yeah. Now, isn't galaxy also suggested of something that is very fuzzy and without edges, a picture of uh, usually connection mm -hmm. to Clinton to, to me look like a, like a, like a, the universe. Yeah. So, yes. Ultimately, I, I put forward the idea that these sort of metaphors are advanced by the, by the kind of thinkers who like to see the technological logic that, that is something that we cannot control. So we feel it with me, but we, we cannot control it. Ultimately, it just happens like the galaxy expands and, and we don't know uh, how to manipulate clouds. That so uh, wouldn't this be kind of like typical idea for someone who is technologically determined. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Metaphors are necessary. Metaphors are dangerous. Absolutely. Um, I actually kind of like technological determinism. Um, but I don't like, I, mean, I think metaphors stick for political reasons. And I think the galaxy metaphor is relatively harmless. I think the cloud metaphor is toxic. And I think there are industrial reasons for the new media industry to invest heavily in the idea of the cloud because it seems innocent, lovely, storm-free. They don't know very much about clouds if they think that clouds are storm-free. But it, the, it, yeah, I think you have to, when you say who's, who's presenting these, these metaphors, because I don't think we, we give up and say, oh yeah, the uh, cloud is, you know, can't do anything about it. I think that the question of what we do about clouds is the question of our moment. I mean, who owns data? Who owns the clouds? I mean, are we going to live on this planet? And are we going to live with these devices? That's the question we have to figure out. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is uh, also concerns Marsha McLuhan. Uh, so I would simply, simply like maybe you could a little bit elaborate about your, your understanding or, or your attitude to McLuhan, or maybe I'd narrow down the question and putting it so that uh, is there something in McLuhan that you don't agree with? Yes, <laughs> almost and everything. What? <laughs> oh, okay. No, that I, could be the answer then. No, I mean, my, my attitude toward McLuhan is kind of like my attitude toward Heidegger, that I, I mock him endlessly and use him constantly. <laughs> and it, it's, it's kind of, the, it's an irony that once you start to read uh, McClellan, he's frustrating, he's repetitive, he makes up facts, he's not responsible, he's a horrible historian, he doesn't really have, I mean, he's willing to just have the, these really broad generalizations, but, you know, he sees interesting things. And, and I'll just tell you, I'm not going to belabor this, but I think that McClellan is a, a grammatical theologian. But, I, mean, I wrote an article arguing that you can... Google it, of course, the ground of being, and find it. But the, I mean, McLuhan's great interest is in grammar, and in the trivial sense, in rhetoric, grammar, and logic. He's interested in grammar, and he's theologically interested in grammar, and that's an interesting project. 
even if he doesn't always do it very well. I like the 50s McLuhan better than the 60s McLuhan also, by the way. I have a question about this that Google is God idea and the ground of being. In fact, so I'm, I'm involved with some students in a uh, political project involving Starbucks. And uh, in fact, if you Google you know, Starbucks labor practices, you get something that is a very whitewashed and censored yeah. version of what's yeah. really going on. Because they're so litigious and they sue people who post anything, so people are afraid. Yeah. So the information that's out there is drastically reduced. Absolutely. You know, you have to yeah. pick yeah. up the phone yeah. or yeah. write somebody an email if you want to know what's really yeah. going on. So people are scared yeah. to express themselves publicly. So, so <coughs> that's one thing, but my broader question is, who's the greatest English poet? No, <laughs> probably Shakespeare. Shakespeare, sorry, I'm, I'm very traditional. I, thought, yeah, I, yeah. I didn't expect Philip Larkin. No. But the broader <laughs> question is, is politically, you know, in terms of liberty and, and those kinds of values, I mean, how do things come down? Is this a positive? Uh, a net positive or, or the, 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 the yeah. internet okay. and, and the kind of communication that's been enabled by the internet. Is it a net positive uh, or, or yeah. are we just like in the China situation, you know, exposing ourselves for retribution? <coughs> I think that's the question everybody, everybody would like to figure out. And I mean, I'm kind of a balance sheet modernist. I mean, I think the, you, you do the pluses and minuses and you can kind of figure out. I don't see the internet as the next step in human liberty. I see it as an interesting new theater to play out the old human circus of desire and lust and rivalry and bitterness and virtue and courage. Um, Google, I don't mean to be saying at all that Google is God. I very much appreciate it. Google is some kind of potentially evil demiurge. And that's why they have to remind themselves, don't be evil. <laughs> I mean, this is, you don't need yeah. to be Freud to know that the things you have to remind yourself are the things you're worried about. And Google was evil in China. Um, you know, there's all kinds of ways that, that people can game Google to create um, link farms. I kept thinking, and in, in Raf, in your presentation on, on Tuesday, that a lot of academic networks are link farms, in which you just have all these, you know, servers which link to each other and let, thereby show up on Google even though they're, they have no real web presence uh, whatsoever. So there's all kinds of ways of, of, of gaming the system. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I, mean, I would really like to know that. Maybe we can figure it out. John, you're here. Yeah. Uh, John, this oh, no, is... Uh, sorry, 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 uh, a few years ago, I was uh, researching with my student Second Life. Probably you heard about it. Is this like online sure. platform where you set up an avatar and you start socializing with people? And what fascinated us was that uh, this platform is not used only for socializing, but there are, for example, a lot of religious movements that open up like virtual churches. And there was this very nice debate in the Ang Anglican Church whether they should not recognize the church as something real, given the fact that there are quite a lot of people yeah. there. And, Secondly, it's also about universities offering real degrees and like real estate businesses selling virtual properties and making millions of dollars. So it's like a big thing. And we can see here like the transposition of everyday life in a virtual life. But this doesn't worry me so much. It, what worries me very much is the opposite process that allows you to digitalize the everyday life. And you showed very nicely the cell phone, you, you know, we, we take pictures at the concert and we immediately post it online. Or a relationship doesn't exist unless it is on Facebook. And now they talk more and more about the Google Glasses that yeah. would allow us to digitalize the very intimate uh, interactions that we have in everyday life. And I think it is very problematic because whereas ancient governments were using papers to keep a record on ourselves. Now we are using the digital media, you know, to keep a record on ourselves. We don't need governments to do this. We, we reframe social life in a, in a digital spectrum and we exist only in so far we digitalize ourselves and we, we publicize ourselves. 
that, that's a really great point. I mean, the virtualization of interaction is as old as the hills. And people have been doing this with, with letters and with texts for thousands of years. And to enter, I mean, religion is cyberspace. I mean, to enter into a parallel universe, which is more real than real. I mean, that's very, very old. But I, mean, I, I agree with you entirely. And that's why um, I refuse to like anything on Facebook. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, it's, I, mean I won't even like my grandkids' pictures, which I know is, is really <laughs> a horrible thing to do because likes are are commodities, and there are subsidiary companies now that will bundle likes and sell them. You can buy a thousand likes or ten thousand likes. Um, and Facebook, had, I mean, the effect that we're willing to give away who we socialize with and what we do with our everyday life for free, I mean, this is just unfathomable to me. I mean, it's just I mean, who owns who owns that data? And famously, every time Facebook retweaks its privacy policy, everything gets more and more manipulable and, and, and open. I mean, Bruno Latour, and it's 2013, the year of Bruno Latour. He has to be mentioned at some point in this conversation, because he's mentioned in every other academic conversation. Makes, makes the nice point about that the digital life is actually more material than, than, than before, because every move in the digital world is tracked and tagged. Whereas when I read a text, nobody's tracking what, I, what I'm reading. I mean, that just that just vanishes in, into the air unless Charles Babbage is going to find it. But I mean, somebody can, can can find this. All right, I'm going too long. Just one, one, one more point. That's why I think a political urgent need is to make analytic skills public. I mean, Google Analytics, analytics in general, you can't leave those to the priests and priestesses who really know how to handle big data. We all need to figure out, or we need to figure out how to make democratic democratic big data if we're going to give this stuff away or we are in big trouble. Sorry, going on too long. You're next. John Grewal, I've got any. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there's a Finnish company that specializes in commercials for Facebook and, and other platforms that make the decision in two milliseconds from the people uh, when they click around and they immediately collect all the information that is available and project especially yeah. the kind of commercials you need. I've seen that. I love it that it's in Finnish because I can ignore it. But what in <laughs> Google, you said Google is evil in China. Is it just about money then? Or are there some other, other reasons behind why they negotiated with China that whenever somebody searches for Dalai Lama, it goes, the net goes down? And what happens when capitalism as a project dies if it collapses? What happens shows? when capitalism collapses? <laughs> <laughs> then, <laughs> then we'll hunt in the morning and fish in the afternoon and be critics after dinner. <laughs> yeah, but no, I mean, the, the thing between Google and China, what's going on? And who's in charge? Well, I mean, Google pulled out of China, of course, they, they say. I mean, and and um, I mean, Google is technically legal. When I was in China, the grad students say you, you can get workarounds to access Google quite easily. but. Um, there are, there are other forms of, of, of internet. And Ren Ren is the Facebook equivalent, and I'm not forgetting the other one. I'll remember it in a second. Some of you will know this. Weibo. Yeah, thank you. It's more like Yahoo, isn't it? Yeah. It's, Weibo is kind of like the Google yeah. version. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know, I mean, is, is economics the, the only source of evil? I want to say no. Um, I mean, clearly, yeah. I mean, power corrupts. I mean, that's. The, the old cliche. I mean, what happens when, when a private company decides that it's going to archive the, the books of the world? I mean, in some ways, Google Books are great. In some ways, I mean, what the heck is going on here? Why don't we have, you know, a, a library of humanity? Why can't we figure out some way that we can subsidize this project and make it not in the hands of, of a corporation? So I, I share your concern that, yeah, the end of capitalism. <laughs> I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> Just doing my bit to make us all a little more neurotic while we wait for it to happen. Other questions? Yes, please. Germany has an important yes. area of Thank you for research. Yeah. Yeah. Why not the uh, United States or Britain, the, the Anglo-Saxon world? Why Germany? Why Germany? Well, it, I would say that German media studies has done something which no other place in the world has done, which is first to take on board the computer, second to understand media as 
transhistorical. Third, to bring a philo philosophical and philological um, approach to the, to the study of, of media. I mean, obviously, I, I write in English and read lots of American and Anglo-Saxon work, but I think that um, you know what's been done in Germany is like the next evolutionary step in media studies, and you've, you've got to grapple with it. You know, the question about McLuhan, I would say the same about Kittner. There are a lot of things I have a, a lot of trouble with, which are, are difficult or confusing. I mean, his attitudes about gender are, I, I want, want to say they're atrocious or problematic. I mean, I don't know. They're, I mean, his attitude about war is, is, is very odd. But it's clear that something about uh, Germany's political history of being split its history of war and destruction uh, on both levels, and its deep investment in the culture of engineering um, has something to do with the, the interesting kind of media studies which comes out of Germany. Not everybody's going to like it, but I find it, for the kind of work that, that I do, really an important step forward that we need to grapple with. Okay, um, you said that the uh, clouds, clouds are not storm free. Yes. What kind of storms could yes. you anticipate in the data clouds? What kind of storms? Well, I mean, I mean obviously the, the question of control. You know, of, I mean, we need like collective knowledge. I mean, a storm in the data cloud, Angela Merkel having her phone being hacked into. I mean, what, you know, what if some evil genius or evil person takes over Google or Facebook? Or maybe they already have. <laughs> and, and we don't know. I mean, the NSA is a pretty easy example of something evil happening in the data cloud. But and I suppose we could torment ourselves with even worse things to think about. Teenage suicides upsets me. Um, comments, online comments, not as profound in the large scheme of things, but very upsetting just to see the sort of license and licentiousness and disinhibition of decent public discourse that people will have when they're commenting online because there's no um, accountability. Those are just little, little storms in the data cloud. But there are all kinds of examples uh, we can think of for serious uh, abuse. I mean, leverage means abuse. And the, putting our data in the, in the cloud allows for new kinds of leverage. And leverage for good or leverage for bad? I mean, that's, that's the uh, question we're trying to figure out. I, mean, that I, I don't think that's a very profound answer. I mean, there's just a bunch of obvious points about things going very sour. Trolls. Yeah. Can I ask a philosophical uh, question? Yeah, I'd love one. <laughs> Several times you referred to metaphysics, the metaphysics, yeah. Of, yeah. Uh, the metaphysics of text, and, yeah. and also the metaphysics of clouds. Mm -hmm. and, and you talked about being. You, you said that being itself, like clouds, could be regarded as a mixture of something and nothing. Yeah. I found all that very interesting metaphysics. Then, uh, if we sort of, you uh, know, we move beyond this kind of metaphors, can we still say that there is some some metaphysical sense in which uh, we can we can discuss the traditional issue of whether there is a real world uh, independent of you know, writing or media or representation? I mean, you didn't use the notion of representation that much, but, but uh, basically, what I'm asking is is whether the traditional philosophical issue of realism in any way survives, uh, well, contemporary media studies, or, or whether media studies has anything to say to those old-fashioned philosophers who are still trying to deal with that issue. What, when you say realism, you mean like medieval realism? The well, reality of, of the universe? No, no not necessarily. I mean, such like, a like, word. well, okay. realism in the sense that, uh, uh, in the sense of uh, the view that there is a world out there that is independent of our yeah. I, I think at its most ambitious that what media studies tries to do is precisely to give an answer to that and to say that whatever exists is that which is mediated. I mean, um, but Kittler has this line, nur was schaffbar ist, ist überhaupt. I mean, only that which can be put into a circuit, a network of circuits, exists at all. And it's the same argument of quo dominus de noctis and honest in mundo, that that, that at some level, everything which is mediated is that which is. And so it, it's a, maybe it's a novel answer, maybe it's an old answer to the old metaphysical question. Because you can see that 
that I that I systematically try to avoid the question of of representation there, because I'm much more interested in constitution mm -hmm. media as constituting whatever is is real. So you could perhaps say that media studies updates the, the traditional Kantian point about being somehow constituted by by us. Yes, I I like that very much. I mean, it, and I mean, I do see media studies being. I try to be modest, but in some sense, I mean the metadisciplinary ambition of media studies, at least as Kittler put it at some points, is to be humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, mathematics, engineering, and medicine. All, uh, all at once, the kind of metadiscipline, which of course is philosophy, PhD, doctor of philosophy. And philosophy is, is the metadiscipline. So media studies as a kind of successor discipline to philosophy is kind of at its most yeah, grandiose, yeah, and since I'm a pragmatist, I tend to try to shy away from such, you know, grandiosity, but I, I find it interesting to, to think about it. Nice. Any other questions? We still have some some time. I'll stay here forever, but... I'm Turaki Maletman from the Helsing Collegium. Thank you very much. That was a great, great presentation. Very thought-provoking. I have a... Um, I'm not sure whether this is a question or a comment, but it's on the concept of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I think in social sciences currently, infrastructure, that's a, that's a very hot topic, yes, or a very, very hot concept. Yes. And one of the reasons why it is so is that it allows us to talk concretely about things which are still structural. So mm -hmm. instead of just saying that there, there, there are these cloud-like structures, like yes. society or culture, so we have really concrete structures. Yes. And I like that. And now you, you've been saying that media, we should see media as, as infrastructure. Yes. And one thing that you didn't mention, but I think is obvious in what you're saying, is that most of these infrastructures that we can recognize are very interdependent. If you want to talk about media, you have to talk about electricity. Mm -hmm. If you want to talk about electricity, you have to talk about all kinds of things, all kinds of infrastructures, military infrastructures, healthy infrastructures. You won't have one without the other. Right. And they, they are all very interdependent. And I, I think this is important. But um, So this is everything that I like in what you're saying. But my question then would be that what I see happening is that the concept of, of infrastructure starts to lose meaning a bit. Mm -hmm. There's an inflation. Mm -hmm. Everything We start to see everything as an infrastructure. And it's very hard to say what an infrastructure itself then is. How do we recognize what is an infrastructure and what is not? Yeah. And, and you could say that it's, it's like uh, partly something that is and something that is not, and it's a mixture. Yes. <laughs> but, yes. but, but that's, uh, that's not saying too much there. So this is my point. Yeah, it's the exact same problem with, with media. I mean, media has, has the exact same problem. Is that, I mean, if you say media and you say radio, television, cinema, newspapers, and uh, magazines, and then you say, but bicycles and numbers and punctuation are also media in as much as they get structured to our everyday lives. And the question is, well, the question, Gilbert and Sullivan put it well, if everybody's somebody, nobody's anybody. <laughs> and it's basically that, you know, prestige and concepts have the same quality as you have to have edges, you have to have, have lines, lines to them. And, yeah, I mean, to, to think about, I mean, um, Star and Balfour, of course, I'm sure you're probably thinking of at some level for infrastructures can be standards by which you make needles, or infrastructures and interfaces built into a, a computers, you risk losing the, uh, the meaning. Yet, Paul Ricoeur defines a metaphor as a mixture of is and is not. McLuhan defines me media as metaphors. And, and I think this sort of comes back to the whole question of metaphors. So how far can you stretch the metaphor before it snaps? And it is true that if everything's infrastructure, then it ceases to be interesting. But it, you want to stretch it far enough so that you, that, that you get some hermeneutic payoff. So that the, calling this thing an infrastructure makes you think about a highway system or a railway system or a healthcare system which doesn't work in the US or what, what, whatever. So I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer, but I think in some ways that's also the nature of being. A mixture of what is and what isn't, something and nothing. Being is a metaphor. 
Sorry. <laughs> we still have time for our two short questions. Anybody who's still left? I, I have many questions, but could you talk a little bit more about hacking and your view of it? I mean, people like groups like Anonymous. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that I have a, a, a really good, and I start with my own uh, political sympathies in this because Robin Hoods, you, you kind of admire the uh, Robin Hoods who stand up to power. It sounds like the classic job of the intellectual you know, speak truth to power. But you know, on, on the other hand, you know, the question of where does civic responsibility and decency start? I mean, I don't know. It, it, do you have an answer to this? <laughs> I, 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 I think yours would be more interesting than mine. I mean, anarchy, nice anarchy. I mean, this is like a, you know, William James is an anarchist. But, oh, cool. <laughs> but, but he wasn't a violent anarchist. And, and so I'm interested in anarchy as long as it, it, it doesn't become violent. And then the question of, is violence against property the same as violence against people? And it seems like what, what Anonymous does is typically violence against property or intellectual property. But I don't know, it's, I, I'm, I'm out of my depth here. Yeah, constitutionally ambivalent, something like that. <laughs> Una más? Good. Yes. Thank you, John. Thank you.